Well, our news team took to the streets today to gauge public reaction to the Prime Minister's national address on crime. As Fern Carey tells us, reaction was mixed. Residents say they listened attentively last evening as Prime Minister Hubert Ingram rolled out a number of crime-fighting measures, including amendments to the Firearms and Dangerous Drug Acts, the addition of two more courts to deal with drugs and guns, and amendments to the bail laws. Mother of two, Lindsay Thompson and LaVon Williams, applauded the measures. However, they believe every Bahamian has a role to play in reducing crime. We have to look within ourselves. Um, we have to take full responsibility for our own actions. We can't keep blaming the government, blaming this one and blaming that one. It's you and it's me. And until then, um, like the Prime Minister said, we would not be a better place. The Bahamas is for all of us. We build this country. We need to pray and keep it out of the hands of the murderers, the rapers, the child molesters. It might not only hit their home, but what about my home? The Prime Minister also alluded to the gun culture as he announced a gun amnesty for all persons with unlicensed firearms to turn them in. Community activist Rodney Monka, who has been the leading voice in favor of capital punishment, says sentences for illegal firearm possession should be longer. I was disappointed in the minimum sentence for gun possession. We have had many instances where criminals have been using AK-47 and other high-powered assault rifles. Clearly, if the minimum should not be 10 years, I don't know what it ought to be. Meantime, amendments are also expected to be made to the law to retain the death penalty as a punishment with the added penalty of life imprisonment. However, these residents don't agree. I really support the death penalty especially for the most heinous crimes. Um, you intentionally set out to kill another human being and then taxpayers support you in prison three squares a day, you get a roof over your head. It might be a six by 11, but it's still a roof over your head. Some people sleeping outside. So I'm saying if you intentionally and maliciously kill another human being, then the punishment is the death penalty. They really need to start hanging, trust me, because if they don't, they come out on the streets, same thing happened again. It was not clear to me how the Prime Minister proposed to carry out the death penalty. I need more clarification on that. Meantime, this concerned resident had this to say about the Prime Minister's address. Everything sounds promising, but I really don't know. Overall, the Prime Minister said each citizen shoulders a responsibility for law and order, and he called on Bahamians to join the fight against crime by enlisting in the National Volunteerism Initiative. Monko had this response to that call. I love the concept of volunteering, and I wish to be the first person to volunteer. Fern Carey, CNS News. Well, many of our Facebook viewers had a lot to say about the announcements coming out of the Prime Minister's address on crime. Ray Angelo Seymour writes, I felt that his address was okay, but we the Bahamian people are just looking to see if they will put any of these plans into action. Yancey Camp writes, any city in the U.S., New York in particular, they have a 1 for 20 rule, whereas every major offense you get an automatic 20 years for every law broken. I was hoping these were the types of changes that would be coming. Anzio Simmons said it should be 25 years for guns, 5 years each bullet. Chrissy Stubb said change will come, and she's optimistic. Nita Smith said, I think four years is a drop in the bucket. With good behavior, the guy will be out in two years. So a guy will tell you, I'll do five years for you. And so that's no time, Prime Minister. Ten years minimum. These guys will get a little scared. Rocky Arnett said, I think the gun laws should be a lot stricter, at least ten years for a gun and two years for each bullet. Maurice Arthur said, I agree with the PM on all of the proposals. Let's just pray that they will be put into action today, not tomorrow. Yuri Kemp felt that it was more of a political one-upmanship rather than introducing new measures. Well, we'd like to offer you an opportunity to weigh in on our Facebook questions. Add your two cents to the conversation by logging on to our Facebook at ZNSNews.com. The Progressive Liberal Party wasted no time responding to the national address on crime. The PLP says six months after promising a nationwide address on crime, six weeks after PLP leader Perry Christie addressed the nation, outlining a comprehensive plan to reduce violence, and two weeks after the murder record was broken yet again, 
the Prime Minister has finally chosen to speak to Bahamians about crime. Now, the PLP says it will support some of the Prime Minister's ideas, but taken as a whole, they are woefully inadequate. Far too little, far too late. Well, today was supposed to be decision day in the Bishop Randy Frazier unlawful sex case. However, Frazier will not find out his fate until next week. The case was adjourned to allow both sides to make further submissions. Frazier is accused of abusing his position of trust by engaging in an unlawful sexual relationship with a 16-year-old girl he was counseling between July 2005 and February 2006. Frazier has consistently denied the allegations. Meantime, the court has been adjourned to October 21st when presiding magistrate Carolita Bethel is expected to deliver the ruling. Outspoken bishop and anti-crime advocate, Bishop Simeon Hall giving his view on illicit sex with children. Today, the pastor of New Covenant Baptist Church issued a statement on the proposed sex offenders register. Hall says child molesters, be they heterosexuals or homosexuals, must not be made comfortable in society. Reverend Hall also claimed that the sympathies which some liberal members of parliament hold toward the gay community will impede any effort to have a national sex offenders register. Hall likened the sexual molestation of a child to manslaughter, and the persons who rape little children upon conviction should face life imprisonment, he says. Well, in studio with us tonight is Bishop Simeon Hall. First of all, thanks for being here. Now, I'd like to ask you, first of all, your thoughts on the Prime Minister's address on crime. Did he address or cover all of the points related to crime that you wanted him to? I, I certainly want to commend the Prime Minister. I think. Uh, if I may, I think he redeemed himself from those uh, hundreds of Bahamians who were becoming rather disaffected from him and his government because of what seemed to be a, a, a slowness in responding uh, to sending out some strong messages uh, to the criminals in our country. I listened, and the one thing I wanted uh, to hear was a strong message to those with a predisposition to criminality. And I think he achieved that. I, I wish to commend him. I also uh, think we should underscore the, the point about uh, patriotic uh, uh, volunteerism. I think that's a good thing. The church mm -hmm. has been doing it for years and to get the entire country now to have this institutionalized certainly moves us in the right direction. Now, since the unfortunate Marco Archer incident, Bahamians have become incensed, demanding a sex offenders registry. But today you said the chances of that are nil, as too many politicians are too liberal in their views. What do you mean by that? I, I do think that we won't see that. In fact, I've heard two government ministers who, who said that that may not happen. I, I think there must be a groundswell. I think I should know if someone is a child molester who lives two doors from me. And the only way that could happen if uh, the community itself, don't forget, we are where we are with these uh, uh, amendments and, and forecasts by the Prime Minister because there has been uh, a groundswell from the average Bahamian. And so I think we must muddy the water mm -hmm. and not accept things as they are uh, and move forward. Mm -hmm. Now, Reverend Hall, of course, you are a national player on the scene, um, an advocate, an outspoken um, individual on many issues in the country. Why make such a broad statement with well, regards to the, the sex offenders I registry? I think it's serious enough. We're talking about children. We're not talking about two consenting adults. We're talking about children. Anyone who molests a child, as in the case of Marco, I don't think we should see him in the community again any time soon, and I would like to see that to be considered as something that is deserving of the maximum penalty. Now, still on the topic, outside of that, you said Minister Loretta Butler-Turner being worried about the downside of a sexual offenders list. Your response was, this is not the time for talking foolishness. What did you mean by that? Well, talking fool is a very serious thing. Um, I just think that's what it is, to say that we're more worried about the sex offended and we are more worried about Marco, I don't think that is what uh, she really meant to say. And one final comment, I'll just give you an opportunity, like 15 seconds. Well, let, let's uh, uh, check into what the Prime Minister said, that it takes all of us playing at different levels to move our country in a positive direction. 
Reverend Simeon Hall, thank you so much for joining us on the Bahamas tonight this evening. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Registrar of Trade Unions, Labor Director Harcourt Brown informing ZNS News late this afternoon that the official results for the Bahamas Public Services Union elections will not be released until complaints received by the department have been addressed. Brown confirmed that once this is done, labor officials will determine their next course of action. We can tell you, though, that when the recount ballots were nearly completed tallying this afternoon, John Pinder's We Care team had reportedly won by a landslide. Public Service Union members went to the polls this past Friday to elect new union leadership. We will continue to follow this story. Immigration officials announcing today that 111 Haitian migrants were repatriated to Port-au-Prince this afternoon at about 2.05 via a Bahamas Air Charter. The group included 30 women and 81 men, 107 of whom were apprehended in the Exuma Keys, Harvey Key, last Thursday. The remaining persons were apprehended during routine exercises here in the capital. Well, it's been more than a month now since Hurricane Irene destroyed the tent that straw vendors have been using for the past nine years. But now with the recent rains, those vendors are vexed. They say their patience is wearing thin. As Carla Palma tells us, vendors say they are ready for a permanent home. For hundreds of straw vendors, it's a choice between working or staying at home. Setting up a stall in the open air and being subjected to varying weather conditions or staying at Woods Rogers Walk, another temporary location since Hurricane Irene forced the removal from under the tent on Bay Street. How is this um, better from where you've been under, under no, the I tent? I would sit my place in the tent right now. If they say move now and go, I would pack up and go back. It's not a case of be careful for what you wish for, because if that were the case, straw vendors downtown Nassau, like Sophie Heburn and Ruth Higgs, along with wood carver James Rolls, say the new straw market on Bay Street would be their destination of choice. Yeah, well, I'm eager to move because I'm in, right here in the swamp. Yeah, and, and the mosquitoes um, flying all around, trying to attack you day and night. I wish they would really, really hurry it up. The quicker the better, but we got to wait till they say it's time to go inside the market. We can't go in there on our own. So that's how I look at it. You got to just take the bitter with the sweet. For the most part, these straw vendors feel their working conditions are going from bad to worse very quickly. The rain come, you run for shelter. When the rain over, you open up try to make a couple of dollars. Okay. The mosquitoes, because where we are, we in the drain. I just feel like screaming. Because when that rain come down, me and this child, he have be completely closed. When you say completely closed? We can't serve nobody, nobody can't come here because the water be as high as your legs. Right here in this area because this is a dream. But what, what can we do? I know the money ain't like that to prepare this and then to see that we get over there. Because if I was building a house and the old one broke down, I had to patch that and, and try to finish that off and move on and then maybe come back. But the, the powers would be pleased. The new straw market, set to house some 600 vendors, was scheduled to open this month. But that date has since been postponed to another date that is yet to be announced. Carla Palmer, ZNS News. In just a few hours, the country will remember the nine people lost in that tragic plane crash. Tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary of the deadly Lake Kalani plane crash. And one year later, the report into the crash has still not been made public. In this report, Ianthea Smith provides an update and tells us why the report has not been made public. A day ahead of the one-year anniversary of the tragic October 5, 2010 plane crash that claimed the lives of nine Bahamians, civil aviation officials are updating the public on the investigations and that long-awaited crash report. According to manager at Flight Standards Inspectorate Hubert Adderley, the report into that deadly crash is complete but has yet to be made public. And he says that's because they're awaiting the National Transportation Safety Board or the NTSB to give their stamp of approval on the findings. He says the man heading the investigations from the international side was delayed by a few weeks due to other crashes he was called on to probe. However, Adderley says he can confirm that the investigations have been closed 
used and the report finalized and ready to go. The names Nelson Hanna, Devon Storr, Corey Farkasen, Clarence Nathaniel Williams, Delon Taylor, LeVard Curtis, Chet Lyndon Johnson, Sasha Mildor, and Junior Lubin would forever be etched in history. On October 5th last year, the nine men en route from Nassau to San Salvador died after their plane crashed into Lake Killarney after the engine reportedly failed. The incident has been pegged as the worst disaster in Bahamian history. But as we mentioned, the details into the who's, what's, and perhaps most importantly, the why's, will remain under wraps for a while longer. Now, civil aviation officials say they can't give an exact date as to when the report will be made public, but they're hoping that it's soon. In the meantime, a wreath laying and memorial service will be held at the Lake Killarney crash site tomorrow, beginning at 8 a.m. Ian Thea Smith, ZNS News.